chapter 2. Right after the book of Hebrews. James chapter 2, verse 19 is our text for this morning. So once you found your place, it will all stand for the reading of the Word of God. James chapter 2 and verse 19. And here the Word of God says, Thou believest that there is one God? Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Now, Father, I pray and ask, Lord, that as I deliver the message here, Father, that you have guided me to present this morning, Lord, that both those who are present, Lord, in this assembly, Lord, and those who may view, Lord, the recording of this, Lord, uh, in uh, the near future, Lord, uh, will be blessed, will be edified, will be strengthened. And Lord, I pray for those who do not know your Son, Jesus Christ, as their Savior, that by this message they would come to that saving knowledge. And we pray and we ask it in the name of and for the glory to your only begotten Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Now, I'm pretty sure that we're all familiar here with the term fundamentalist. Uh, I mean, if you've been in Bible-believing Baptist circles for any amount of time, that terminology comes up, that descriptive term. The thing is, I don't believe that everybody is necessarily familiar with what the fundamentals of the Christian faith are. Uh, and what brought me to this message, what God used to spur me with this, was a comment that uh, a friend made about the five fundamentals of the Christian faith. Five. And there's a whole lot more than five fundamentals. <laughs> So that's what I'll be preaching about this morning is the fundamentals of the Christian faith. So that being the case, again, uh, I need to clearly establish the fact. We are discussing Bible-believing, direct lineage Christianity. Okay. okay, we're not discussing the... Fundamentals of the faith as taught by the Roman Catholic Church. We are not talking about Mormonism, Universalist, uh, uh, what do they call it, the Unitarians, Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day uh, Adventisms, uh, folks that uh, believe in glossolalia, you know, the fancy term for speaking in tongues, apostate pro Protestant churches, for that matter, apostate Baptist churches. All right. Direct lineage Christianity would be those churches that by virtue of their belief in what the Bible says, not what they think it means, okay, uh, can trace their lineage back to the church in Antioch, Syria, back in the first century, where believers were first all Christians. Okay, Christian simply meaning little Christ. They reminded them of Jesus Christ. And okay, direct lineage churches would be those churches that hold to the doctrines as received by the first century churches, uh, essentially what today is known as Paulian doctrine, the doctrine taught through the epistles of the apostle to the Gentiles, the apostle Paul. And I make this point because of the text verse that God laid on my heart. This verse tells us, 
that every Roman Catholic, every Mohammedan, every Jew, every cult, every apostate, every heretic who claims to be a Christian or claims to, I believe in one God, are all on the same level and the same footing as the devils. <laughs> thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to pick it up at verse 13. Who are these people? Well, Paul describes them here. For such are false apostles, <clears throat> deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel. Why? For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of life. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers, his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. Now there's plenty of these running around now just the same as there were in Paul's time when he's giving a warning here to the Corinthian Christians back in the first century. So believing in God and how many people have you talked to when you've been with Oh, I believe in God. I've heard that so many times. That, you know, it doesn't do one single thing, the fact that you believe in God to ensure your righteousness and your salvation. And the devil's belief. Yeah. In fact, it's taken for granted, as we were talking about in Sunday school this morning, it's taken for granted that people believe in the living God. Psalm 14, 1, the Lord says, the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. You know? How can you not believe that there is a creator, that there is a God? You're a fool, the scripture says, if that's the case. And the Bible doesn't waste one second, the words of God don't waste one nanosecond of time trying to prove to anybody that God is. So I mentioned in Sunday school again, Genesis 1-1, very first verse of scripture in the Bible, in the beginning, God. And not one word in there about trying to prove or justify the fact that God is and who he is and what he can and can't do or anything else. Nowhere in the scriptures in that. Only the fool believes in his heart that there is no God. So... The fundamentals are the, the, the fundamentalism came out of a time period in the United States and in Western Europe uh, at the turn of the previous century because with uh, the coming in of things like German rationalism and the West Cotton Port uh, uh, abomination of uh, so-called uh, Greek text uh, and other things where you had liberalism and humanism uh, and apostasy and heresy uh, making great strides and gains in the churches of Jesus Christ, uh, many faithful men of God uh, began to push this mentality of the fundamentals. The fundamentals of the faith. And we'll speak a little bit more about that as we go along. Thing is, the very first fundamental has to be without question or qualification the fact that we have God's perfectly preserved words. Because without that, 
You know, it's not even, as they will say, the inerrancy of the scriptures, because many people call the scriptures into question, because they will say that, well, while everything that we have today is simply a translation of the originals, and of course the originals no longer exist, Everything that we have in the original languages is a copy. Not all of them agree with each other. Therefore, what we have is somebody's best guess. <laughs> you know, and you can pick and choose what you want. Well, that's hogwash. Okay, My God <laughs> is more than capable of preserving his words for us. And... So, the very first essential of fundamental beliefs of the Christian church is that God has preserved for us His words perfectly. And that they have been preserved for us in the universal language of these last days, which in these last days, the universal language is English. Okay. Even the texts that were used to give us our English language Bible, the Textus Receptus, exists no more. Burned up in the London Fire of 1666, St. Paul. Gone. All right. God did that for a reason, because people would just keep going, oh, well, you got to go back to the receptus. No, it's gone. God has perfectly preserved his words for us in the authorized Bible of 1611. I will not use the term version, because it is not a version. It is the perfectly preserved words of God. It is the King James Bible, the authorized Bible of 1611. God preserved it at that point in time in history in the English language and how it is used at that time because that was the only point in time where you could do a literal sensible translation of the Hebrew and Greek into the English language. You couldn't do it with English as it's spoken today. How can I prove that? Look at every other so-called Bible out there in the English language. They're an absolute abomination. Wouldn't touch them. So there's our very first essential fundamental. Okay, and without that, nothing else matters. I don't care what you say your fundamental beliefs are. Or that If you don't believe the Bible, if you don't believe that the Bible is the perfectly preserved words of God, it doesn't matter. Okay, and Neither do non-biblical sources. Neither do the traditions of men. Neither do the personal preferences and opinions. The only thing that carries any weight whatsoever for the Christian is God's preserved words. The rest of it, well, less than a drop in the bucket. <laughs> Now, I mean, without perfectly preserved words of God, you can't have it. There, there, you have to have faith. Okay? Plain and simple. We walk by faith, not by sight. Like I say, originals, long gone. Okay? These fools out there that talk about, yeah, we believe in the original plenary you know, documents. Well, good for you. Okay? You, you might as well believe in the tooth fairy. <laughs> uh, that, that's how much it's going to do for you. Okay? And that's a critical point. But let's move on from there and look at a few of the others. Um, and I'm just going to list things. For example, that Jesus Christ is God. The deity of Jesus Christ. Okay? Be the Word of God who became a man, Emmanuel, God with us. And because of that, okay, he is the only begotten Son of God. God has many sons. Every angel is the Son of God, but he's a created Son. 
every human being is a offspring of Adam. Adam was a created son. Okay? Because Adam fell, though, man lost the image of God. Men are not the sons of God. Men are not the sons of God. Unless and until they have received redemption in the case of the church age by exercising faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, receiving that as a free gift by grace, then they become sons of God positionally, doesn't matter whether it's a man or a woman, a boy or a girl, okay, because they are adopted. So God has created sons, God has adopted sons, but God has only one begotten son, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ, begotten as a man, all God and all man. This was done because he was, another fundamental thing, born of a virgin. Okay, you don't believe in the virgin birth? Sorry, don't call yourself a Christian. Okay. Without the virgin birth, okay, he was born of a virgin by the supernatural act of the Holy Spirit of God. And as a man, okay, another fundamental of the faith, as a man, okay, born of God the Father via a virgin human mother, okay, he had no sin debt. He had no sin debt. Jesus Christ was born in the image of his Father, body, soul, and spirit. Just the same as Adam when he was created was body, soul, and spirit. On top of that, and connected to this, is the fact that Jesus Christ never sinned, never once violated the laws of God. Therefore, he had an earned righteousness, something that you can't do. He had an earned righteousness, and he had the ability to accomplish that by keeping the laws of God because he was in God's image. Okay? Man, okay, as the corrupt sons of Adam, do not have a spirit. Therefore, there is nothing that they can do to justify themselves before a holy and righteous God. They need a sacrifice. They need a substitute. They need someone to be a propitiation for them. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the next of the fundamentals. And a lot of times folks will bundle them all together. Uh, we have the fact that Jesus Christ took the sins of the world upon himself and became sin for us. He suffered on the cross at Calvary and he died there. He died physically but he also died spiritually because he became sin. He lost his spirit. He was separated from God the Father. And so when he died because he died as sin, he descended into hell, and he suffered three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, a lot of times they will include those all together as one fundamental death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. I, I see them as separate things, because the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is an important separate doctrine. Uh, I saw a post the other day on Facebook. Somebody said there's 142 religions in the world. I think there are more. And by religion, I mean what men do to try to justify themselves before God, which they can't do. But there's only one empty tomb. Yep. Amen. Amen. All right. The bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is an incredibly crucial, fundamental doctrine because if Christ didn't rise from the dead as Paul says we're still in our sins yep. 
the price wasn't paid, but he did. That he was seen of over 500 witnesses over a period of 40 days. 500, more than 500. Okay, you only need three witnesses in a court of law, human court of law, to, to establish a fact. You know, over 500. <laughs> and he ascended into heaven and is seated right now at the right hand of God the Father, waiting for the time when God the Father will tell him to begin the process of his second coming. Now, a lot of people will not include in the fundamentals the fact that the Word of God is perfectly preserved. Okay? They will talk about the, the fact that the Bible is inerrant, but what they mean by that is in the original document. Right. And most of them end where I just discussed with Christ having ascended into heaven and being seated at the right hand of God the Father. Well, what about salvation by grace through faith and the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ? Is that not a fundamental of the faith? Okay. Every Catholic out there okay, will tell you they believe everything that I just said. Okay? And every faithful Catholic, no matter how sincere that they are, and I was raised as one, are going to die and go to hell in their sins. Why? Because they do not believe the fundamental of the fact that Jesus Christ provided a salvation for us through his finished works, plus our minus nothing. You don't add to it. You don't take away from it. That's heresy. There are only two ordinances for the church. These are the fundamental facts. The first is believer's baptism. The second is the Lord's Supper. Believer's baptism is a pictorial ordinance. It is representative of what occurs to a person when they accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior and they are buried with him in the likeness of his death and they are raised again in the newness of life. It's a pictorial ordinance. It is meant as one to be a witness publicly of one's faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. It has no saving grace connected with it whatsoever. So is the case with the Lord's Supper. It is a participatory ordinance. It is a memorial. Okay? And as a memorial, it is pictorial in nature. Okay? You don't have the actual body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ there. Okay? And anyone who says that is a heretic plain and simple. Christ said, do this in remembrance of me. There's nobody in this world that can call down Christ at will and lay him out as a fresh sacrifice that appears as a little round wafer of bread. Okay? Bologna. Or turns into wine, which the priests hog for themselves now anyways. A bunch of wine -o. Yeah, all they are. How about the doctrinal position on the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ? Is that not a fundamental of the faith? Okay. If you believe the Bible, which is the first of the fundamentals, you must be premillennial in your belief in regards to the second advent. That it is a literal, physical return of the Lord Jesus Christ to this earth to set up his kingdom to take back that which is his. It is, the reference to being premillennial has to do with the blessed hope, often called the rapture. Okay? The first resurrection 
as mentioned in the scriptures, has three parts to it. You have the first fruits, you have the main harvest, and you have the gleanings. Jesus Christ and the Old Testament saints were the first fruits. That he might be the firstborn of many brethren. The harvest, okay, is what we call the blessed hope or the rapture of the church, which occurs before the millennial reign. In fact, it occurs before the tribulation period. And then the gleanings, which are a pre millennial rapturing of the tribulation period saint. The church does not go through the tribulation. Okay? Now there's many who are going to say, okay, well that's it. There's no more. Everything else after that is a non-essential or peripheral uh, and uh, uh, it's you know, up to your opinion. Well, really. How about the doctrine of the Great Commission? Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Is that a non-essential? Is that a peripheral? Is that something that is, you know, something you can take or leave? No. The whole nature of the Church of Jesus Christ is to be one of being, that's the term that they would use is evangelical. To go and share. That's why we put such a huge emphasis on missions. Okay? A church should be supporting mission work. Okay? Going beyond the borders of their locale. Okay? Every Christian should have the knowledge of being able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with somebody. Okay, now I'm all for organized evangelism in churches. But that doesn't work for everybody because of life. <laughs> okay? A Christian, okay, the very essence of who you are is being a witness and testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. And you do it whenever and wherever you are able to. Okay, if you can't, you know, in the very first church I belonged to, we had Thursday night was an organized soul winning. You know, and then we would do it again on Saturdays. Okay, to allow, uh, but we had people that couldn't make either one of those just simply due to the nature of things in their lives. But that doesn't mean that they weren't being witnesses and testimonies for Jesus Christ. They would talk to people when and where they could. They would leave gospel tracts for people when and where they could. Okay? There's no, you know, requirement that if you don't show up, you know, at 10 o'clock on Saturday morning to go door-to-door -door soul witnessing with the church, that somehow you're a bad Christian. Maybe some people can't do that. <laughs> okay. Another subject for another day. Okay. Carrying out the Great Commission is a part of who you are. And it's something that is supposed to be a part of who you are and what you do all the time where the opportunity presents itself. Well, how about some other things that we're commanded to do in the Bible? How about the education of the body so that it grows and matures as it should? Well, guess where that edification comes from? When the body gathers together like we are here this morning. How about resisting the devil? We are commanded in the scriptures to resist the devil. Is that a non-essential? Is that something that's peripheral and does or doesn't have to be followed? How is that not a fundamental of the faith to resist the powers of darkness 
in this world or being separate from this present evil world. We're commanded to do that in the scriptures. We are commanded to separate ourselves away from reprobate Christians. To have a prayer life. We're commanded to do that. How is that not a fundamental of the faith? We're commanded to study the scriptures. Why don't we read the New Testament? <laughs> yeah. Or that one. Or you know, you know, yeah, I have my personal devotions, you know, once a day. I mean, no, to study the scriptures. Study. Okay? That takes serious pointed effort. I mean, this is the mind of God. And it's alive. See, the fundamentals of the faith should be things that are going to lead you to more knowledge, more wisdom, and more understanding. So that you do grow and you mature and are striving to become what God believes you have the ability to be in this life. Are we ever going to be what we're going to be in the life?